Um, this book um, begins in 1860 when Australia has some extraordinary uh, institutions in place by world terms. Um, I remember when I was reading uh, in the, uh, the uh, Times of London for 1868, I was actually reading about the trial of a great uncle of mine, John Keneally, who was on the last convict ship to WA. And he, uh, uh, my eyes strayed to the editorial column and the editorial said, I can't quote it exactly, we notice with interest the development of extraordinary um, and perhaps excessively democratic institutions in Australia. And it is just as well that we observe how they progress because as when a surgeon devises a new treatment, he does not use it on a respectable person before he has tried it on a corpus vile, C-O-R-P-U-S vile. Similarly, we should watch this corpus vile in Australia and see how things uh, go. Uh, those institutions were in place. Uh, the gold, um, Australia's mineral history, uh, never-ending mineral history had begun. Uh, uh, and uh, there were four billion acres of Australian country that belonged, of course, as we know from the Mabo decision, actually to the uh, indigenes, uh, uh, had been occupied by pastoralists. Uh, the Victorians were beginning to move up into Middle and North Queensland and even into the Northern Territory. And they said that Queensland fed half of Tarak. Uh, and the convicts, as I argue in the book, didn't all die conveniently to make Australia respectable as soon as transportation ended. Uh, they lived on into the 20th century. For example, I mentioned briefly my wife's great, uh, she was in, in uh, volume one, my wife's great grandmother. Uh, she gave birth, this convict, to a child who lived till 1942. Ned Kelly was the son of convi a convict, Red Kelly, and his little brother, Uncle Jim, uh, Kelly, as he was called in the 30s and 40s, lived uh, until 1942. As a matter of fact, Judy and I went down to visit Ned's relatives on the old farm at Greta, East Greta, and um, a descendant, uh, one of the Griffiths, told me that she had taken Jim Kelly, Ned Kelly's brother, to the opening of Woolworths in Benalla. And he got overexcited and he started throwing 10 shilling notes on counters and say, I'll have half a dozen of those, half a dozen of those. And she told us without any irony that she had to tell him uh, uh, the, the brother of Australia's most famous bank robber, she had to say, Uncle Jim, don't throw your money around like that. Not everyone is as honest as us. <laughs> <laughs> so the convict, children of convicts and the convicts lived to be a, a, a considerable age. Um, Western Australia took them in just as we were abandoning transportation in the East because uh, their population was only 50,000. They needed the labor, they needed population. And Earl Grey, who tried, was a very progressive British minister, tried to uh, populate Australia with, uh, by fair means or foul, collaborated with people like Carolyn Chisholm, brought, sent the orphan girls from the famine to Australia, the, the workhouse orphans to Australia. So um, tra uh, the convicts are still alive and behold the idea of Australia as a place where you send unsatisfactory people was still operating because Dickens had two dumb sons called Alfred and, uh, uh, and Plorn 
and he thought, where do I send them? I send them to Australia. He suspended Plorn's Latin uh, lessons and wrote to his headmaster, he will not need them given the rough and hardy life he will lead in Australia. And uh, I suppose the Dickens bo boys uh, serve as a, a key to the way the book works in that uh, through um, Edward Bulwer-Lytton Dickens, whose nickname was Plorn, given by his father, who arrived in Australia uh, at the age of 16 and went to Wilcannia, 80 miles beyond Wilcannia, Momba Station. Through him you can look at the the merciless impact of the rainfall patterns of Australia, which explain why, despite Billy Hughes' predictions that we would have 200 million by the end of last century, we didn't. We see that drought thing, and yet uh, the Irish, the Scots, the English determined to pursue the idea of land possession and of cattle. Uh, you know, a man being measured by acreage and cattle. So the Dickens boys were dest destroyed by drought, like it's an old Australian story. Uh, they were destroyed by rabbits, which Pasteur tried. These boys were dest destroyed by drought, like it's an old Australian story. Uh, they were destroyed by rabbits, which Pasteur tried to... Um, uh, obliterate in Australia. He tried to do it so he'd get a £25,000 uh, prize from the state government from Henry Parks. But Henry Parks was determined A, to get the cure and B, not to pay Pasteur. Uh, Henry Parks never paid his debts, that's why he was always going bankrupt. Um, and um, so you see all this, and you see an asthmatic stock rider, a German stock rider called Charles Rasp at Mount Gibbs Station in fairly godforsaken country, even in Australian terms, out beyond the Darling River, out in the Barrier Ranges. Charles Rasp goes riding with a mineral. Um, it, it, it's the uh, time to bring in the sheep from remote areas of the run so they can be shorn. It's this time of year or a bit early uh, and he rides out to, um, uh, to muster the sheep but also, as I say, with a mineral guide <coughs> in his pocket. And he sees this broken hill, lowercase b-r-o-k-e-n-h-i-l-l, -L, and he takes a few ore samples from it, sends them to South Australia and that's the beginning of Broken Hill and the rise of the Labour Party in Broken Hill. And you can see all that through, um, uh, through um, the Dickens boys' experience because Plorn is a member of Parliament down here in Sydney and the Labour Party are after his seat in Wilcannia. And the emergent Labour Party bump him off in their inimitable style which they seem to have lost, actually. But just imagine, when I say inimitable smile, just remember Bob Hawke and nifty Neville Ryan, and you've got the picture. Anyhow, uh, the uh, question, one of the questions that arose in the 19th century was that art, was art possible in Australia, in this barbarous place? Uh, Adam Lindsay Gordon, some... Uh, uh, English uh, gentlemen were sent here, like Plorn and his brother Alfred Tennyson Dickens, but others self-exiled themselves. Amongst those was Robert O'Hara Burke, the Irish explorer, totally incompetent explorer. Thank God he died on his expedition, or we would have uh, he would have been a national joke instead of a national martyr to the nullity at the core of Australia. Um, some another one who self-exiled himself was Adam Lindsay Gordon, 27 in 1860, <clears throat> and with only another 10 years to live, 
But no tender philosopher. He was a boxer, a mounted trooper, a horse breaker, and an extraordinary horseman in all ways. He too had become wayward in his soul and in, and in that was characteristic of a number of well-bred Britons who brought their flaws to Australia, a place that was well designed to magnify them. A graduate of the Royal Military Academy, Gordon came to Adelaide in 1853 and became a trooper and, uh, and rode in um, uh, steeple steeplechases. And then in 1862, he married Margaret Bach, a girl of 17, um, and began to write poetry. And it began to at attract attention. He was even elected to the South Australian House of Assembly for a time. And his poetry continued uh, even after he lost an election. Uh, and he's, the titles of his poems show uh, that he was a well-educated man. They were called Phoenix Exoptatus Quare Fatigisti and Exodus Parthenidae. Now, Exodus Parthenidae isn't anything classical. It's about someone um, uh, being tossed off their farm by the bank because of lack of, what else? Lack of rainfall. Um, the bank manager appears, and I found him civil and even kind. But the game's up here. We must weigh the anchor with the surf before us and the rocks behind. Throughout uh, this period of being hard up, uh, he published verses in The Australian and Bell's Life in Victoria. He tried to run a livery stable in Ballarat and again went broke. He had a bad riding accident in 1868, jumping fences and barriers, which he always did. He was always showing off on a horse. Thank God he didn't have a Harley Davidson. His only child, Annie, died and his wife left him. Uh, but for all this bitterness, Lindsay Gordon seemed a romantic figure. At Flemington, he ran three steeple ra uh, he won three steeplechase races on one, after uh, on one afternoon, and writes, there were bookmakers, trainers, touts, heavy swells, and their jockeys light, the man that drinks and the man that shouts, the carrier pigeon and the carrion kite. In March 1870, he fell badly in a, cheap, a steeplechase and suffered a head injury. The day before he shot himself on the beach at Brighton in South Australia in June 1870, he published his bush ballads and galloping rhymes. rhymes. To a reader of his best known extended poem, The Sick Stock Rider, it seems as if he'd always expected to be destroyed by the bush. And that expectation was very profoundly placed. You know, it's there in Patrick White's great novel, Voss. It's there in the death of Burke and Wills, the eyed nature. And that was very strong up to my generation. I think it probably, you know, since the invention of the barbecue, it's began to decline. Um, there was Hughes. These are all men who have died in the bush. There was Hughes who got in trouble through that business with the cards. It matters little what became of him. But a steer ripped up Macpherson in the Kuraminta yards, and Sullivan was drowned at sink or swim. And Moston, poor Frank Moston, died at last a fearful wreck of the horrors at the upper Wandenong. And Carisbrook, the rider at the horsefall, broke his neck. Faith, the wonder was, he saved his neck so long.